Star Wars, a series many people hold dear to their hearts since childhood or its breathtaking galaxy full of diverse planets, colorful and unique characters from many strange and wonderful alien species, and one of the most expansive fantasy lores of any fictional series that almost never fails to captivate and pull people in with countless immersive stories spanning multiple generations. The only thing that could possibly make the series more immersive would be to allow someone to put themselves in it. And for that you have... Knights of the Old Republic. But Jedi Knight Jedi Academy comes in at a close second. The second installment in the Jedi Knight series, with an innovative style of gameplay as both a third-person action game as well as a first-person shooter. With a variety of different missions to play through on many different planets throughout the Star Wars galaxy, and this game in particular allowing you to take control of your own custom created character and use a vast array of different force powers from both the light and the dark side of the force, Jedi Academy offers you the chance to determine how your character's fate will play out. Certainly an interesting idea back in 2003 at the time of the game's release, but are these ideas sharp enough to make the game stand out above other games throughout the series, or will they chip away at the game until it can't make the cut? That's what I hope to determine in this review. Like in my Eyes of Heaven review, huge thanks to my good friend, The Scape Rom Files, for getting me the gift cards to allow me to revisit this game from my childhood. Spoilers ahead for the game, obviously, so click away if you wish to play the game yourself unspoiled. But if you're okay with spoilers or have already played the game, let's cut right into this, shall we? Taking place a full decade after the events of Return of the Jedi, Luke Skywalker is attempting to restore the Jedi Order to its former glory and reinstate Jedi as peacekeepers of the galaxy to deal with threats like the Remnant of the Empire. Basically a bunch of Imperial officers and stormtroopers who refuse to give up power. And to do this, he has collected a bunch of teenagers throughout the galaxy in hopes of making them the next Order of Jedi. Most of them are presumably Force-sensitive kids, but then we have your character, Jaden Kor, who can't even use the Force at the start, but who just so happen to have their own lightsaber for some reason, which we will never learn. During the game, you'll meet Rosh Pennon, your personal headache for the majority of the game, as he comes out of nowhere to invade your personal space and complain that he won't get a lightsaber like you have immediately. But during your arrival to the planet housing the Jedi Academy, the craft is shot down by a mysterious evil force. This leaves you and Rosh on the other side of the shuttle crash from the rest of the survivors, and you two have to make your own way to the Jedi Temple. Oh goody! The very first mission of the game is an escort mission, and Rosh is pathetic pathetically frail too. There's a point during the second half of the mission where you have to jump across a very small gap created by a river in which Rosh will lose a full third of his health simply by jumping across this gap. So you'd better make sure he hasn't taken much if any damage up to this point or you may as well start the whole level over. Reach the Jedi Temple and you'll find two stormtroopers, and Rosh, who up to now will be laughing at the danger and saying he'll be a great Jedi, elects you to jump into the danger instead of him and deal with it. Then after you take care of them, you'll immediately be attacked by an evil force user, but not a Sith Lord, that's an important detail. Deal with him and you'll find more Evil Force users and a woman with a strange scepter that seems to be shooting a beam at the temple who immediately knocks you out. You'll soon wake up to be introduced to both Luke Skywalker and Kyle Katarn, the main character of the series before you. 
After getting your side of the story, they both agree that something strange is going on, but need to investigate more to be certain. It is then revealed that this was all a trick to draw Luke and the remaining Jedi away from the Academy, so an agent of these evil forces can steal important records from Luke's important files. You and the other Jedi initiates are then assigned to Masters, and you are lucky enough to be assigned to Kyle's student, but unlucky enough that you'll have to share him with Rosh. You know, budget cuts, some um, masters had to take two students. Kyle then puts you guys through the ringer, and Rosh starts showing off a bit of an Anakin complex, doing questionable things to get ahead and be the best, like sending a killer robot after you to win the course first. This is where one of the game's problems will come in, how negative emotions lead to the dark side. Jane was understandably pretty upset about this, as one would be, you know, Rosh did just try to murder you, but when Jaden gives Rosh the cold shoulder and acts a little moody, like teenagers often do, Jaden is canonically 13, Kyle actually lectures Jaden about not getting angry, even though he even admits they're perfectly justified to do so. And from there, Jaden is a pretty generic protagonist, not having any real outbursts of anger or anything until later on in the game. But more on that later. Luke will then come in and tell you that the symbol on the robes of the Force user you killed in the prologue are the symbol of Marka Ragnos, a Sith Lord who died over five 5,000 years ago, but what they could possibly want is a total mystery. From here, you will be given a tier of five missions to do in any order you choose. It might seem like a lot for a rookie, but don't worry, Kyle will be with you every step of the way. Kyle will travel with you on most of your missions in order to instruct you and ensure your safety. Remember that because it's super important. And before each mission, you are allowed to choose one of four powers per side from either the light or dark side of the force. But this personally rubs me the wrong way, since at the end of each tier of missions, Luke or Kyle will evaluate your choice of force powers and scold you if you choose more dark force powers. Or even equal parts. Then why did you even let me choose in the first place? You only have to complete four of five missions in order to move on in the story, but I highly encourage you to complete all five missions, as each mission gives you one point to put into a lighter dark side force power to increase their effectiveness. More on that later, but for now, just know that not doing that last mission is missing out on a chance to power up one of your force powers. And after about two missions, we'll see Rosh's Anakin complex kicking in strong, since he starts to question if Kyle is holding him back and not letting him do enough or becoming more powerful. Jeez, dude, at least Anakin had years and years to build up a resentment to Obi-Wan. How much time could possibly pass in two missions? Can you see why I don't like him yet? Complete the rest of these missions and it will be revealed that the evil force users are using the scepter you found in the beginning in order to steal force energy from places with high concentrations of it throughout the galaxy. So Luke sends you to Hoth to check out the old rebel base. Here, you will meet your rival, Alor. Voiced by, by the way, the voice of Azula before Avatar even came out. And the two of you will fight, then you never see her again until the second to last level of the game. I haven't seen such a fierce contest of will since Naruto and Sasuke. Back at the very start of the series when Naruto was pathetic and Sasuke didn't give him the time of day. It's that intense. Then you return to the Jedi Temple and report back to Luke and Kyle, who are so impressed with your work that they raise you up to the rank of Apprentice. Wait, what? I thought I was already an Apprentice. Aren't I Kyle's Apprentice? Okay, and during some point in the next tier of missions, Rosh just so happens to get himself captured. Hard to believe that the guy that hurts himself jumping wasn't up to a tough mission. Maybe Kyle should have let him do more, he clearly wasn't getting enough experience. Complete the rest of the tier and you will go to the planet Vajoon, where Darth Vader had a stronghold. It is here you will discover two things. First, that Rosh betrayed you and joined the dark side for more power and because he resented Kyle. 
You weren't even a Jedi for a week, dude! And you'll also discover the leader of the cult, Tavion, an enemy from the previous games, Alora's master, and the dark opposite of Kyle, who she holds a grudge with. She then claims that Mark Aragnos, who is dead, is somehow giving her all the power and knowledge she needs before she uses your lightsaber to destroy the room you are in, as well as the lightsaber, leaving you and Kyle to die, but you narrowly escape. You then get back to the academy, Luke tells you to make a new lightsaber, and he promotes you once again to a Jedi Knight. Jeez, they're handing out these promotions so often they don't even feel special anymore. I was only an apprentice for like a week. Five more missions and Luke calls everyone back to the temple to explain that he believes that Tavion is attempting to use the scepter to resurrect Ragnos after being dead for 5,000 years as enough force energy infused into a being's cells will cause them to regenerate and bring the person back to life. All right, now I know you're making this up. So, the entire Jedi Order is heading out to the planet Korriban, a burial ground for countless Sith, obviously including Ragnos. However, before you can join them, Kyle tells you he received a distress signal from Rosh, who suddenly wants to be good again. My god, this dude cannot stick to a side. At least Vader needed to watch his son almost be murdered to turn on the Emperor. So you have to go to a lava planet, Tasper 3, and fight through an army of Dark Force users and Imperial officers to get to him. And I have to stop right here to bring up this game-breaking bug. At one point during this level, you'll encounter a building with a glitch where you cannot save the entire time you're inside, or when you run into this one enemy on a bridge at the very end of the level, your game will crash upon attacking or engaging him every single time. I actually had to look this up, and it's a well-known bug in the game that's been a problem as far back as 2019. Surely it can't be that hard to patch it out. So get to the end of this next level, and you'll discover that Rosh has actually led you into a trap to save his own skin. And this is the main problem area of the game, in my opinion. As I've said before, Jin has basically been a model Jedi as far as the story is concerned up to now. Resisting anger and temptation and basically just being a good little protagonist. The only real problem coming from when Rosh almost tried to kill him with the robot and, according to Kyle, right after Rosh betrayed them on Vijun, even though Jaden did nothing but try to convince Rosh to come back to the light side and didn't show any signs of anger the whole time. Now, Jaden basically starts throwing a temper tantrum and bullying Rosh, while Kyle and Alora try to convince you to spare or kill Rosh, respectively, giving the story a divergent path for a light and dark side ending. Sparing Rosh will keep you on the light side, you apologizing to Rosh, even though he betrayed you multiple times now and Rosh rejoins the Jedi but then Alora attacks you out of anger then suddenly turns around and cuts Rosh's arm off I mean that's great and all he gets some kind of karma but it feels like a strange choice for her to start fighting you then suddenly take a time out to attack Rosh but killing Rosh will send you down the path of the dark side and this is where the game just gets dumb Yes, Jaden gives in to their anger and kills Rosh, but this is one crime of passion against an entire game of basically being enough of a boy scout to make Superman blush. But after this one arguably justified action, your character goes from the perfect pure paragon to a relentless raging renegade who now wants to take the scepter to use it to rule the universe themselves. I've heard the dark side ending in Knights of the Old Republic also comes out of nowhere, but at least there's more choice in the game that makes the dark side ending make sense. This is just a heel turn so fast a cheetah would get whiplash. But either way, this ending goes down. You kill Alora and then head to Korriban yourself to get the scepter. If you choose the light side ending, you will be able to encounter and fight alongside other Jedi against the Dark Force users, finally having some backup for once. 
and this basically makes it a breeze to get through the levels. However, the dark side ending will see you fighting both sides of this war, basically doubling the amount of enemies you have to take on. Either way, get to the end of the second level of the mission and you'll encounter Tavion and engage with her in a battle. In the light side ending, she will become desperate after losing the initial fight and somehow free Ragnos evil force ghost to possess her and fight you again with a normal metal sword hidden inside the scepter supercharged with force power. But 5,000 years of being inactive allows Jaden to beat Ragnos and destroy the scepter, preventing Ragnos' resurrection forcing him out of Tavion's body and back into his tomb, while Tavion dies from being unable to handle the possession. Jaden then exits the tomb and throws their lightsaber to destroy the roof and seal the tomb, even though someone could totally still get in there, it's barely blocked off, and gets praised by Luke and Kyle for a job well done. Jaden says they owe it all to Kyle, and they go back to check on Rosh, who is decked out with a new arm and learns a valuable lesson about patience and everyone appreciates and values each other. Yay, friendship. Pretty standard ending, but still nice in my opinion. You are ultimately rewarded for staying true to the ideals of a Jedi. Very nice. But in the dark side ending, you will kill Tavion and then have to face Kyle as he confronts you. Despite liking this ending less, Kyle is by far the better fight. Ragnos basically plays similarly to a dark force user wielding a single lightsaber, but Kyle has various powers from both sides of the force, using grip to fling you halfway across the room, healing with force heal, blasting you with force lightning, or protecting himself from physical and force attacks with force protect and absorb. He'll even grapple you in a chokehold for massive damage if he's able to get close enough. Technically you don't even defeat him. Jaden has to use the scepter, blast him in point blank with a beam of force energy, then bury him under a pile of rocks. They will then escape with the scepter and take over a nearby Imperial Star Destroyer while plotting to take over the galaxy. This was actually supposed to be the canon ending, which would allow for a second sequel where you play again as Kyle, who leaves the Academy to hunt down Jaden. But this idea never came to pass. All in all, it was a decently solid story, even if the dark side ending feels really unwarranted and out of nowhere. Nothing groundbreaking, but it didn't try to be too much and come off as overreaching or too ambitious. It's just a simple story that allows you to put yourself in the shoes of a Jedi and does a good job of it. This was probably the first character creation game I've ever played, and while I think they did take away a bit from it by giving Jaden an actual name, I feel like they could have gotten around it by having them call you things like you kid dude buddy pal friend buddy chum pal friend buddy pal chum bud friend it is still a solid game in the character creation genre and will always hold a special place in my heart. And just to cover everything, let's run down the list of missions in my personal order of completion. The Merchant Rescue will see you travel to Blengeal to rescue survivors of a crashed merchant ship on your own, since Kyle is off on another mission with Rosh. Kyle will travel with you on most of your missions in order to instruct you and ensure your safety. Upon reaching the atmosphere, your ship gets struck with lightning and crashing, with several pieces fried and needing replacements. You step outside to look for surviving merchants, only to see the last one get eaten by a giant worm known as a sand burrower. From here, you have to traverse the area for replacement parts of your ship while staying off the sand, or else you'll be eaten instantly with no chance to escape or save yourself. You can use force speed to briefly move across the sand, but it doesn't last very long and you'll constantly be waiting for your force energy to recharge. You can also use thermal detonators to throw and distract and even kill the worms, but they'll immediately respawn so killing them is pointless. Droid Recovery sees you going to Tatooine to look for Jawas that possess a droid with knowledge on the Disciples of Ragnos. Kyle arrives with you, but then decides to stop and talk to the locals, and sends you off alone to find the Jawas through a valley filled with Tusken Raiders. Kyle will travel with you on most of your missions in order to ensure your safety. 
So you had to fight off the raiders, find the Jawa's sand crawler, break into it, find the droid and escape with it while protecting it from the last wave of enemies you'll face. And during one point in the sand crawler, you'll come across an area filled with lava. And for the longest time, I thought the only way to get across was using force speed to get across before the lava could kill you. Turns out there's actually a leaking pipe you can cut open to harden the lava and make it safe. But other than one tiny leak in the pipe, you would have no indication that that is what you are supposed to do. Not even Force Sense, an ability that shows you hidden objects and how to solve certain puzzles, tells you how to do that. The investigation on Corellia has you and Kyle heading to a planet in the middle of a huge thunderstorm when you suddenly receive a distress call from a speeding sky train about an attack. So Kyle sends you down to do the dangerous stuff while he provides air support, which he will do all of one time. Be sure you're safe. Then you go through the train, clearing out enemies while avoiding falling to your death and bolts of lightning before deactivating a bomb and stopping the train when they try to ram it into the station. Emergency assistance has you receiving a distress call from an important station that is being attacked by the Empire, and you have to disable five bombs to save the station. Oh, and Kyle was supposed to show up to help you, but he never does. Mission 5 has you and Kyle investigating mercenaries on Tatooine, but Kyle abandons you once again to go drinking at a cantina when mercenaries suddenly attack. Chewbacca then makes an appearance and helps you out throughout the mission. Then Luke sends you to Hoth to investigate the Force Presence, where you will ride Tauntauns to reach the Rebel base, where you are introduced to vehicle controls, which are terrible. The turning is slow, the steering is janky and unprecise, and the boosting will send you flying into a wall more often than not. These controls are only used one more time throughout the game, so I feel like they should have never been included at all. This starts the second tier of missions and we started out with the only other vehicle segment in the game and the absolute worst level of all contact meeting on zanju 5 is the definition of a filler mission you just show up to meet a contact but they're killed before they can even say anything important so you have to escape quickly as possible that's literally it but throughout this mission, you have to travel on these speeder bikes. Initially, they seem pretty cool, but once again, the turning is terribly slow and the steering is imprecise. And if you hit the booster, you are going to wind up slamming into a wall, doing serious damage to the bike, getting it dangerously close to exploding or getting stuck. And all your enemies will be on these bikes as well, either hammering you with blaster fire or ramming directly into you. And if you are off the bike for any length of time and get hit by one of these bikes, you are guaranteed to die instantly. I can only reliably get through this mission with god mode sheet switched on, and even then you could die at the end due to a jump that requires the boost which you have to do with flawless timing in order to make it. I hate this mission with every fiber of my being. Rescue mission on Narcrita involving you saving some village elders captured by the local hut. So Kyle sends you in to save them while he s waits safely in the ship. Ensure your safety. You will have to rescue them without either them or you being eaten by a Rancor, which is nice to see a staple Star Wars creature in the game. This is one of the only times where the choice of weaponry you pick before the mission is important. I would recommend the Shot Cannon and Fletchet Gun, as a single shot from the Shock Gun can stun the Rancor for a few seconds, which gives the prisoners precious seconds to flee. And it can be stunned again immediately after the first stun wears off. And the Fletchet gun does the most damage to the Rancor of any weapon. Again, you can kill it, but this is ultimately pointless as another one will immediately respawn. One funny side note I like about this mission is that certain enemies will actually run up 
t on you with only their fists to attack you. And at one point, they lay down claymores to blast you with, but the punching enemies will run towards you and set them off themselves. STOP IT! Covert Operation sees you partnering up with Wedge from the attack on the first Death Star, now made into a general, working to capture an oil installation from the Empire by placing beacons in each area for Wedge to fly by and attack, then shutting down bombs after the Empire tries to blow up the installation as a last ditch attempt to keep you from taking it. The investigation on Dosun is is one of the best and worst missions in the game at the same time, but certainly the most unique. You are captured by the Imperial Forces stationed there, but the arrogant and deranged captain of the outpost lets you go so he may hunt you down, similar to the classic book, The Most Dangerous Game. This culminates into a boss battle at the end of the level where he has the high ground and shoots at you with one of the most powerful weapons in the entire game, which can kill you in three shots at most, and the shot explodes to hit you, so even if the initial shot misses, it can blow up the walkway near you and do splash damage, while making it harder to reach him with the broken walkway. And on Coruscant, you will try to capture a crime lord who blows up the bridge leading to his base, forcing you to navigate around the city to reach the base. This level introduces assassin droids, which have shields to protect them from attacks and electrocute you if you try to touch them, but they must drop the shields to fire at you. Your best bet to take them out is the shock gun or force lightning, assuming you've acquired the power. Vajoon is next, and by far the most arduous mission in the entire game, coming in as three separate levels. The first involves you running from cover to cover, avoiding acid rain, and fighting giant, bulky, and tanky stormtroopers who all have the gun the boss in Dosun had. And they'll come in groups of at least two. After this, you'll enter Vader's temple and enjoy two levels of fighting almost entirely Dark Force users with some Imperials sprinkled in for good measure. This introduces you to enemies that will often utilize Dark Force powers of grip to choke you and leave you vulnerable to enemy attacks or drain, which drains your health and force power. On to Tier 3, which is painfully short. The cult sighting on Chandrila doesn't even have a cutscene. You just run through an ancient Jedi tomb to fight Dark Force users and look for Tavion, who isn't even there, and you seal off the tomb so the Force energy can't be stolen. Even though Tavion already drained it from a building, so I doubt a closed door will do much. An investigation on Tanab sees the Disciples of Ragnos unleash a giant mutated Rancor in a spaceport. This time, no weapons will slow it down, and you have to avoid Disciples and lead the Rancor through the spaceport, where it destroys everything in its way, but gets stopped by a small container pushing it into a laser wall. Yolara sees you dismantling a cloaking device Darth Vader used, defended by Nogri, who blast you with poisonous gas that you can't block and you get to hear the disgusting sound of Jaden gagging. It even manages to stop the disciples pretty well. The Force Theft Investigation sees you and Kyle being pulled into a Star Destroyer, so Kyle sends you to disable the tractor beam while he tries to make the ship explode. Ensure your safety. And finally, Order Mentel sees you simply blowing up some weapon caches, no big deal. And there's only one enemy to deal with, Boba freaking Fett. Surprise, surprise, you can't kill him, and he spends the whole level shooting rockets and flamethrowers at you. So, that's the story. Nothing too incredible, but if all you're looking for is a Star Wars game where you make your own character, that's all you need, as long as you avoid the ridiculous dark side ending. Okay, so the story is decent, but if the story is only decent, the gameplay has to be a step above to make the game worth remembering. So how does the gameplay stack up here? 
Well, let's slice right in and see what we've got. First off, you will have to make your own character. This was mind-blowing at the time, but its age really shows, as the options are very limited. First off, there's only six species options for your character. Three male and three female. There are both male and female humans, while females also get the iconic Zabrak and Twi'lek species. That's great. Meanwhile, the males are left with the Keldor and Rodeo species, two of the ugliest humanoid alien species in the series. From there, you only have three options for head slash facial options for each race, except the Twi'lex, but only because their head tentacle things can be in two separate styles. From there, you just have a very small number of clothes options to pick from and what color you can pick. Again, except for the Twi'leks, whose skin color is what changes instead, so you best like the colors their clothes come in. You never get any more clothing options or even a chance to change your clothes, so you better like the appearance you give them the first time. But you may have trouble getting a good feel for the appearance as the creation model slowly rotates your character as they walk in place, so you never get a good chance to stop and look at the appearances you're giving them. You have to speed judge it on the fly. Who thought this was a good system? And by the way, they all play the same, so if you were hoping that each species brought something unique to the table, you're going to be disappointed. After this, you get to create your lightsaber. You can only make one single-bladed saber to start with, and only get the option to make dual sabers or a saber staff at the painfully short final third of the game. Your saber can be either blue, green, orange, purple or yellow. Basically all the original colors throughout the series except for red for obvious reasons. Though you can change the color to red in the cheat options. What I find interesting here is that both types of sabers have about nine different types of hilts to choose from. Your lightsaber hilt the part of the weapon you're almost never going to see in great detail has more customization options than your avatar. I can't be the only one who finds that ridiculous. Now onto the actual gameplay, which I'm happy to admit is pretty solid for the most part. Unlike most traditional Star Wars games where you play as a Jedi, you are not limited to just your lightsaber. You will also be able to pick up a number of blasters and explosive devices along the way, turning the game from a third-person action game into a third-person shooter, though you can also switch to third-person shooting if you so desire. And you will also be able to choose a weapon loadout at the start of each mission. You will always have your lightsaber and a DL-44 blaster pistol, but you can choose from any number of secondary blasters and unlock more two at a time in further mission tiers. To start with, you have the E-11 Blaster Rifle, a Stormtrooper standard weapon, a Wookiee Bowcaster, which should need no introduction, the Destructive Electromagnetic Pulse 2 gun, which shoots small spheres of pure electricity to stun enemies, and the Tenlos Disruptor Rifle, a weapon so brutal it's actually been banned throughout most of the galaxy, which fires a powerful laser beam. The first unlockable weapon is the Imperial Heavy Repeater, which shoots out tiny spheres of light at minigun rates. Then there's the previously mentioned Golan Arms FC-1 Fletchet Gun, which is basically just a shotgun. Our final two unlockable guns saved the best for last. The Stoker Concussion Rifle, used by the mini-boss Captain on Dosun, and the large Super Troopers, which fires huge bursts of energy that creates a concussive explosion upon contact to damage any nearby enemies even if they aren't directly hit, 
and the Marson PLX-2M portable missile system. Basically your standard rocket launcher. Keep in mind these last two weapons can be redirected with force push, so think twice before blasting Disciples of Ragnos with these. And for explosives, you have trip mines, which can be placed on a wall or floor and have a trip wire beam that explodes when something touches the beam. Detonation packs, which can be thrown down and remotely detonated at a time of your choosing, or thermal detonators, which act as your standard grenades. But each weapon has a secondary firing option to make them far more versatile. The blaster pistol can be charged to fire a more powerful shot. The blaster rifle has a rapid fire option. The the bowcaster shoots beams that bounce off of walls. The disruptor rifle can be zoomed in to snipe enemies and can be charged for an even more powerful shot that, at max power, can vaporize enemies on a molecular level. So this thing could take out Deadpool. The heavy repeater lobs a short range concussive blast. The fletchet gun fires mines that detonate over time or in close proximity to an enemy. The concussive rifle fires a massively powerful beam that one or two shots just about any standard enemy. And the rocket launcher fires a homing rocket. The thermal detonator can be made to explode on impact or the trip mines can be used as timed explosives. Even your lightsaber can be thrown and come back to you like a boomerang, even if it is terrible for most of the game. And of course, it wouldn't be a game about Jedis without force powers. You have the standard power every force user has. Push to knock back enemies and push in switches. Pull to draw things towards you. Disarm enemies and pull levers. Speed to make you move faster. Jump to leap higher into the air. Saber throw to throw your lightsaber. And sense to find hidden items, figure out puzzles, and read your enemy's health at the highest level. The these level up on their own after you complete the story mission after each optional mission tier. From there, you have four force powers to choose from, from both the light and dark side of the force. Light side features force heal to recover from damage, force protection to lessen damage you take, force absorption to nullify any force attacks used against you, and force mind control to make enemies attack each other or stop attacking you. The dark side features the classics, like force grip to choke enemies and leave them open to attacks, or lift and throw them off of a ledge at the highest level. Force lightning to blast enemies with <laughs> to quickly kill normal enemies or finish off mechanical enemies easier. Force drain to steal life force and energy from force users and force rage to make you stronger and faster at the cost of losing health. But at the highest level, you cannot be killed until the power wears off, though you will be slowed down and have to recover when it does. You get a chance to unlock and upgrade these powers at the beginning of each optional mission with a single point to be put into a single power and all of these abilities have three levels to them, really only being extremely effective when upgraded all the way to level three. But the main missions after the five tier missions do not offer upgrade points to your force powers, so you only have 15 times to upgrade these powers. So your best best bet is to pick 5 powers you think are the best and upgrade them to level 3. Having said that, I think the game really gives you more of an illusion of choice here, because the light side powers of heal, protection, and to a lesser extent absorption are almost required to get through the game. There are healing items throughout the level, but they are few and far between, and force drain requires enemies to drain health from in order to work, so you're going to need healing. And as for force protection, the first mission on Vajun after the second tier of missions will see you having to endure acid rain along with stormtroopers carrying that OP concussive rifle I told you about before so you'll need force protection to avoid taking damage from the rain and lessen damage from the rifle it is almost impossible to get through this mission without this power and the game never 
gives you any indication that something like this would happen. So if you decided to use only Sith powers up to this point and don't have force protection now... Well, out of luck. And finally, while it isn't as necessary as the other two, force absorption will make a world of difference against the Disciples of Ragnos from this point onward, as they will know force grip and drain, both of which can kill you very quickly. You can use force push to get them off you, but in order to use your desired force powers, rather than an assigned button like in something like The Force Awakens, you will have to scroll through a list of your force abilities until until you get to the one you want. And in the case of Force Drain specifically, it will take your Force Power along with your health. So if they suck away all your Force Powers before you can reach Force Push, well, this takes some good points away from the game, as it presents you with all these choices of Force abilities, yet you practically need these three powers filled to the max leaving you with only two other powers you can fill to the max. And as I said, these powers are really only good when they're fully upgraded. So if you think you're gonna learn all of the Force powers, just keep in mind, a jack of all trades is a master of none. But you might be thinking, Sai, this is all more technical stuff than actual gameplay. How does it feel to play the game? Well, like I said, the choice to switch between third-person action to first or third-person shooter is really unique, and I feel like it's implemented well here. You can choose to rush through like a badass unstoppable Jedi swinging around a lightsaber to block lasers and dismember people. Oh yeah, you can straight up chop off a hand or even whole arms in this game. Or you can be tactical and use a blaster to maneuver around through an area and pick off enemies in between whenever they aren't firing. Although one gripe I have with this is that some weapons share the same ammo supply. So if you think you're going to just use one gun until it's empty and and then use your next gun, you'd better think again. On one hand, this does make you have to be smart and resourceful with your ammo, punishing you for just wasting it all haphazardly. But at the same time, different weapons are obviously for different situations. And if I, for instance, use all my ammo shooting guards with my blast rifle, but now need that ammo in my electric gun for dealing with droids or an at, -AT which are in the game, by the way. I'm not gonna have it, and it kind of feels like the game is putting too much pressure on me to meticulously manage my ammo that much. Early Resident Evil titles also forced you to carefully manage your resources as well, but even they weren't that harsh on you. But then again, I suppose that is more of a minor point, as even without ammo, you will always have your lightsaber, and this is where the combat truly shines. The lightsaber combat is some of the best in any Star Wars game. Your character swings the lightsaber with how you move. For example, if you're moving right, your character swings from right to left, and vice versa. So you can move back and forth, swinging in whichever direction you feel would be best in that situation. And while I personally find some of them can be somewhat difficult to perform, there are a number of moves and combos your character can pull off with their lightsaber, some even incorporating force powers into it, or factoring in your enemy's position in conjunction to yours, like stabbing enemies knocked to the ground with force push or pull. The only gripe I have with this is it doesn't incorporate any of the countless vastly different fighting forms from throughout the Star Wars mythos, like Obi-Wan's classic defensive style of Seresu, or Mace Windu's unique Vapad style, using the enemy's own dark side power against them to power up your own style. You have your basic fighting style, and after the first main mission on Hoth, you'll be able to unlock one of two new additional fighting styles, either strong style or fast style. I don't remember any of those anywhere on the list. But in all seriousness, strong style involves slow and wide, but powerful strikes with great range, or fast style with high speed attacks, but low damage and reach. 
or at least as low damage as a lightsaber can do. I never quite understood this. It can be helpful to change up your style when fighting Disciples of Ragnos, but otherwise I don't see a point. As lightsabers can bring down most opponents, the Disciples of Ragnos included, in one or two strikes at most. So why would you ever want a much slower style that takes longer to land hits that your opponent could potentially get away from or hit you before you land your hits. And eventually you will get to use either dual sabers or a saber staff which brings yet another style of combat into the mix with their own unique combos with the option of switching back to use a single saber if you desire. There is an almost endless number of ways to engage with your enemies, especially the Disciples of Ragnos. As the main enemies of the game, you'll be fighting these guys at increasingly frequent rates. And since they have lightsabers too, they are the most dangerous enemy in the game whenever a Rancor or bike isn't involved. They can have various abilities from the dark side, as well as force healing on rare occasions, so you have to be smart when dealing with them. Simply rushing in swinging your saber is a good way to get killed. They can switch up their combat styles almost as much as you can as well. Certain weapons can get past their defenses, like the Fletchette gun, but they can pull your blasters away with forced pull as well. I've tried all different ways I could think of to fight these guys with all different force powers in conjunction with lightsaber fighting, and while there is no real wrong way to fight them, there is no one right way either. Until I discovered crouching while walking forward while spinning either dual sabers or a saber staff like a maniac. And sometimes, when you both swing at each other at the same time, you'll enter a saber lock, trying to overpower the other and break through their guard, leaving the loser open to an attack that is almost guaranteed to kill, unless they're cheating with force rage. One final thing I love is that there will eventually be disciples who attack you with only force powers, so if you have Force Absorption, they literally can't do anything to you, and you can just walk up and kill them with no issue. It feels so broken that there's this one type of enemy in the game they made a complete counter to. The only final gripe I have with the game is the save system. There are checkpoints in the levels, but they are few and few far between, so your best bet is to frequently save after any big event or any fight in the level. However, each time you save, rather than overwriting uh, your current file, the game will just create a new file instead, which will leave you overwhelmed pretty quick. So you'll probably want to delete older files you don't need, but the menu can be a little hard to work properly at times. So if you're not careful, you may wind up deleting the wrong file and screwing yourself over. All in all, while it could use a little polishing and one or two levels leave a few unwanted chips, like the bike level, the game overall feels pretty sharp. So with all this in mind, what are my final thoughts on the game? <laughs> Well, the story was nothing special, but for a game that lets you just be your own character in the Star Wars universe, it does everything it needs to. If only it hadn't taken a bit away by giving the character a name you didn't choose, and throwing a dark side ending out of nowhere when your character has been nothing but a precious golden child up to this point. Maybe if they'd given a bit more player input at certain areas to allow you to be a bit nasty at times to warrant a dark side ending, I might have let it slide. But as is, it feels really forced in all the wrong ways. But since that's just one ending, it can be overlooked. That being said, the character customization is also pretty limited and it shows. And the gameplay is great, but it gets bogged down by not giving us enough points to acquire all the force powers, 
making certain powers basically mandatory to beat the game, judging us based on the powers we pick, an annoying weapon wheel for both weapons and force powers, only getting options for dual sabers or a saber staff at the last third of the game, which is way too short, and some grinding vehicle segments, it's hard to give this game anything more than a 7 out of 10. A rolled blade. There was a sharp product here once upon a time, but it took some damage that made it lose its cutting edge. That being said, there's still a few sweet spots that make it enjoyable. I think this game could really benefit from a modern remake. Not a simple remaster, but a full remake. Fixing the infamous game-breaking bug, making a better save system, giving us some more customization for our characters, maybe even making different species play differently, giving us the option to make what kind of lightsaber we want at any point in the game, adding more styles of saber combat to toy around with, possibly adding a handful of extra missions to be able to acquire all the force powers, removing the vehicle segments, and just maybe giving a bit more choice to justify a dark side ending, then this game could be razor sharp, to the point it would be a cut above any other Star Wars game you might consider playing. But that is my opinion on Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. What did you guys think? Did you think my points were fair? Was I a bit harsh at times? Not harsh enough perhaps? And are you now interested in the game or have I put you off from it forever? Let me know down in the comments below. But for now, thank you all so much for watching. If you like this and want to see more, go ahead and slash that subscribe button. If you like this video, give a quick cut to the like button, leave a comment down below, share it around with all your friends, be sure to click the notification bell so you never miss it when I upload a video, and be sure to follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Then I'll see you in the next video. But until then, ladies and swordsmen, stay sharp.